other ways of packaging up code. But I looked at April 2023 and April 2022. And so on the left-hand side is basically the different ROS distros um, last year at this time. So blue is ROS2, red is ROS1, green are Python packages that people download off our servers. Um, you can see that that blue section has gotten a lot bigger. The red section has gotten a lot smaller in those years. Um, if I if we actually calculate through those numbers, we are on our servers, we're at 45.1% of all ROS packages or ROS2 packages now, or 45% of all packages downloaded from our servers are ROS2 packages. Uh, last month alone, we had 43.4 million ROS packages downloaded off our servers, which if you take a look at that compared to April 2022, that's a 17% increase year over year. Those are VC numbers, like you said, it's great. So, so that's just your reminder that you need to transition to ROS2. That's sort of the stick. I'm gonna give you the carrot, all the cool stuff that we just put in here. New release is called uh, Iron Irwini. Irwini comes from L, what is it? Elsea Irwini. So it's a turtle from Queensland. It was only described in 1990. It was described, you know, the crocodile hunter, the crikey guy who wrestles, he discovered it actually. So it was um, discovered, I think it was first published in 1990. Uh, there, there's one interesting fact. If you're just telling your kids about this turtle, there's one really interesting fact. It can breathe through its kalaka. You should go look up what that is, but it's at the rear end of a turtle. It's an interesting science fact. Um, so we, we have swag up for sale. Um, we also gave away a lot of swag for the community. This is one of probably, it's not only probably our biggest ROS2 release, but it's also probably the most community involved ROS2 release that we've ever had. So when I went through and systematically looked at the release notes, it was kind of like 50-50. Here's open robotics. Here's somebody from the community putting something out. I think we had... I want to say there's 270 community members were involved in building this ROS release. And that we, when we did testing, I want to say we closed 500 and some or 600 and some testing tickets. And a huge chunk of that was the community as well. So it's been a, a really big community effort. Um, if you'd like, to, so everything I'm about to talk about, it is all in the ROS2 release notes on docs.ros2.org or docs.ros.org. Uh, you can follow that QR code. It'll take you there, but I'm going to walk you through everything that is in this ROS release. So first up, uh, big, useful, wonderful thing. We now have Python API documentation on docs.ros.org. So no more looking around for it. It is all right there. I, we need to do a little bit of work to make it easier to find what you're looking for in there, but essentially all of anything that's in ROS index, you should be able to go look at the Python docs right off of docs.ros.org. You're able to pick your release. Um, this should make anyone who's developing software very, very happy. First big actual feature that isn't documentation related is that rep 2012 uh, actually it has been merged into uh, iron. So ROS, ROS, sorry, rep 2012 is the service introspection rep. And I know that's a big mouthful, but fundamentally what service introspection lets you do is it lets you pick apart and easily debug raw services. So if you've ever been in a situation, say I, I'm working on a robot, I'm developing a robot, uh, robot crashes on a service call. You don't know why, you don't know who called that service. You don't know what data went into that service to make that, that failure happen. You can actually now create a whole service topic that's like a sidecar topic to your, your service. And you're able to see what's going into that node, what happened, uh, what data was it sent. This is a huge, huge win for being able to bug large raw systems. And all you have to do is just, you just have to set a parameter and you get this for free. Um, I'm gonna kind of gloss over the code because I don't think you can see it on the screen. But after most of these sort of like subsections where I talk about what's new in Iron, there's also links directly to the documentation and the example code. And we'll send this around afterwards as well so you guys can go find the thing you're particularly interested in. So next new thing in Iron, uh, pre and post parameter callbacks. So before, when you had a parameter, you just set the parameter, that's it. Now you have pre and post parameter callbacks on parameter set. 
this is really cool because it, it allows you to say, if you have like say a complex set of parameters in your raw system, like you parameterize something, right? There's some fudge factor that you go and set on every robot. And all of those parameters are say bound together into one object, but you only want to set one variable in that object. So you don't want to sit there and say, change this, change this, change this. You just want a service call or a parameter call that will change. You change one thing, it actually changes the whole set of parameters and sets, does all the sort of downstream function calls for you. And here's an example, you can basically see it's just, you know, in Python, it's just a hook. You just add your, your function in there and you get a call back. Um, and, and the cool thing about this is I think this should make it way, way easier to add new CLI functionality, particularly like if you trying to build a CLI around some of the some of the features that you're building or perhaps your own nodes. It makes it a lot easier to build complex features. So next up, matched events. So there's this problem in ROS, right? If it's not a problem, but say you have, you're doing really complex computer vision work, right? You have this big neural net that's very, very um, ex expensive to run. And you start up your ROS system and it just runs. And maybe you're not using the downstream data out of that neural net, but it's just sitting there running, eating up like 50% of your CPU. What you can do now is you can get um, a publisher event callback. So what you can do is take your node and you can say, hey, no, don't do anything until somebody actually connects to my downstream messages. And that will, then you can trigger all of your processing and it should make it way easier to make more efficient systems. You could do this before. I mean, you could kind of hack it together, but now this is an API level call. So you can do it very, very simply. And that should be available in both C++ and Python. And Maybe you can see this. There's a little bit of an example there, right? It's just setting a callback and you can basically like set a flag and trigger your complex processing. Next up, external logger configuration. If you've ever been working with a ROS, log, with ROS logs, have you ever been in a situation where there's just too many log messages and you wanna dial it down to very specific log messages to one part of your system? you can do this. So basically what we've done is um, you, you can now set node level log levels. So here's an example. Uh, so what you can do is you can take an individual ROS node, say, I want that node to run at extremely verbose, log everything, tell me what's going on. And then the rest of the system just like, you know, very, very high level logging. And you're able to tune the system by setting parameters to get very like granular ROS logging. So for example, if you're in a situation where you have say a new ROS node that's, I don't know, beta testing, which you really care and you wanna see all the log information coming from that node, you can do that. And then you can just leave the rest of the system running in its nominal uh, configuration. And, and here again is a quick example and where you can find the source code and examples for this. Um, but it's it's very trivial to implement and it should make your life a lot easier. All right, so a couple other things. So launch, RCL, CPP, RCL, and CLI. That's in ROS, or ROS Iron. So we've done a ton of work improving launch files. This is a subset of what's out there. Uh, you can now call Python expressions inside of your launch file. So say you want to... I don't know if this is a good thing, but you want to parse a CSV file in your, in your ROS launch, look up a bunch of stuff, have some processing, and then go do it. Possible now, if, if you want to use a CSV library. Uh, TTY and YAML and XML launch files, which means that you can now have coloring on screen from your YAML launch files. Uh, there's a ready to test event, so you can set up a bunch of stuff and then wait in your ROS launch file to then go run a test. Uh, we have a launch log directory uh, substitution. So you can just say, here's my log directory. I don't know where it is. I set it at the beginning of a function. Um, and then the other big one is if you're a big user of lifecycle nodes, there are now a single function that lets you cycle through a lifecycle node inside of a launch file. So if you want to initialize your lifecycle node, that's available. Uh, speaking of lifecycle nodes, one thing that we've done is you guys know that there are 
nodes now and life cycle nodes. They're both sort of, they inherit from each other. But you have to go and the way code is structured now, you have to basically write a function for each of them. So we created a new unified node interface that should allow you to go and um, write one function, a function that takes in um, any sort of node, whether it's a, a lifecycle node or a regular node, and process it appropriately. Should, for, for people that are doing node work, this should cut down on a ton of work for you. RCL Pi improvements. So similar, we've already sort of touched on this, um, but you can have a wait for node function. And it's basically a simple one line function to wait for another node to join the graph before you do anything, which is should be very, very helpful for, for making complex systems come up easier. There's now an async parameter client. So if you say want to set a parameter, but it may take a while and you don't want to block on that, you can get a callback basically when that parameter has been set. Um, finally, you can get message info in topic subscriptions now. So if you have a topic, you're getting input from a ROS topic and you wanna know more about that topic, you can actually um, create a, use this function called create subscription and look at the info coming off that topic. So this is a cool one because this is a, a free speed up that you can get by just setting a parameter. So what we found in the previous version of ROS is there were some assertions when you were creating large messages, which assertions are good, right? The assertions check that something's not broken. However, we determined that they were causing quite a bit of a slowdown. So basically we've made it so you can toggle these things on and off. Um, if you need the assertions, if you want very, very robust code that checks itself as it goes along with the, the cost of like, oh, it's gonna take some time to actually create these messages, you can do that. If you just want things to go fast and loose and you're okay without assertions, you can get basically a 30% speed up on the creation of large message types. So this is the biggest one. It's the end cap. I had to get my appropriate color end cap in here. But um, so end cap, if you, if you haven't heard yet, we've actually changed the default bagging in ROS2. So the default bagging is now using this format called MCAP. It's an open source standard. Um, and what it does primarily, I mean, it, it, it does increase throughput a little bit from what we found empirically, but the big one is it changed how the message, what data was stored in, in the bag file. Previously, basically message definitions weren't stored in bag files. So to pick apart a bag file, you needed to have the original message that came along with it. Now that's all wrapped up inside of your bag file. So this should you know, make it a lot easier to play bag files. Um, Box Club in particular has done a lot of this work. It makes it easier for them to build all these very, very slick looking front ends. Um, and it's also more performant. Uh, from what we've seen, you know, it's not like a, a huge test, but from what I've seen, some people are saying two to five X increase in message throughput using this format. Along with that, we added a few enhancements to ROS bag. So there's, there's better playback. Um, you can play bags for a set number of seconds. If you wanna say set up a very limited test off a larger bag, um, you can start a bag at a specific time. If you want, if you have say, my robot broke at this timestamp, I wanna build a test for that and keep running that test off the bag, totally possible. Um, you can now start and stop ROS bagging using a service. You can pause, resume, go forward, all using a ROS service. Um, and you can also search through bags now using a regex. So if you're looking for some, if you have some complex thing inside of your, your ROS graph, you can actually regex and find what's in it. Let's see. CLI cleanup and ergonomics. Uh, we did a ton of work to go clean up some of the uh, the issues with ROS2 CLI. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I think the biggest one is now we have automatic headers and automatic now macros. So if you are trying to use the ROS command line interface to send a message and you've ever tried to do this, it was a pain because you have to get the message just right. You have to get everything in there and you have to get the timestamp just right. And now when you create that call in the CLI, 
you can just say, oh, just do this automatically. And it should make it a lot easier to use the ROS2 uh, CLI. Oh, also ROS2 topic uh, respects sim time. That's a big one. Couple more, uh, new message filters. Have you ever tried to line up two messages, but they're not approximately sunk up? We have an approximate epsilon time message filter. So if something, if you want to line up two messages, but they're not exactly timed, you need like, you know, 100 milliseconds in between them, we can, you can do that automatically now. Um, and you can also synchronize up to nine messages um, by upsampling. So if you have things coming in at different rates, but you all want to work with them at one frequency, that can actually be sunk up, you, up to nine different topics. Arvid's improvements. Uh, you can now binarize robot maps in Arvidus. So if you want a simplified map view, one click. Uh, the ROI in the camera display, um, basically the camera display in Arvis now respects the camera info message. So it should appear much more realistic than it did before. And this is the last one is a big one for anyone who uses SolidWorks. Um, uh, there was a bug that impacted STL files exported from SolidWorks. So they didn't import correctly, fixed. So you can you should be able to export right straight from SolidWorks, get it into Arvis, should make your life a lot easier. So, so that's about it. I just wanted to remind everyone that, you know, we do have a ton of resources. If you want to learn more about these things, there's the Ross Wiki, answers.ross.org, which I, I should mention here is going to go away or is going to go into maintenance mode in the next few months. There is a big post on this on Ross Discourse that you should check out. Um, we also have Ross.org Discourse, where I sort of regularly post Ross News, um, and then also docs.ross.org. And a quick reminder that Roscon is coming up uh, in, uh, let's see, it's October 18th of this year in New Orleans, uh, which means that uh, talks, talk proposals are due July 9th. And also we, we have diversity scholarships this year. So if you have, say, interns or students that you think would benefit for coming to Roscon, please bump them and say that, oh, you should apply for this diversity scholarship. It's a, a free trip to Roscon. And then last but not least, uh, you know, we sort of started talking about intrinsic and uh, OSRF. OSRF. OSRF is again, a nonprofit foundation. So they always need support from the community. So that's just a donation link that you can use to go find where to donate to OSRF. And that's it. I'll take any questions you have. Am I good on time? Yep. Do you have any questions from the audience? Stop. Yeah. That's really nice. So basically, you know how functions to use create client on both of them, or is it basically that they inherit from each other now? Uh, I think it's actually an abstract interface class. Okay. Yeah. So it's instead of they inherit from each other, it's like, here is this interface class that represents both of them. I believe that's how that was implemented. Brandon would be the person to ask about this because we went back and forth. Like, well, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like that. Oh, yeah, there's there's a ton of stuff in there. You guys should check it out. Other questions for Kat? Or is Kat uh, in the food line? <laughs> Kat, thank you, thank yeah. you for uh, sharing us uh, with this, us, this with us today. Um, yep, yeah. exciting, exciting stuff. Okay, thank you, Thanks. guys.